The following interview was conducted with Professor Lyle Albright, Professor Emeritus of Chemical, Chemical Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June 23, 2008, at his office. It's the University Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your siblings and early years and education. Okay. I was born in Bay City, Michigan, but my first home was on a farm about six miles away. I attended a one-room schoolhouse and fortunately had excellent teachers. Um, there, I was able to skip two grades. I suspect my teacher hoped that that would permit me causing trouble while in school. Uh, from there, I then went to an excellent high school in Bay City, Michigan. I paid 75 cents a week to ride with a classmate. Uh, in the same building uh, uh, was a junior college, which I attended after graduating from high school. When I graduated from junior college at age 18, I was flat broke. And our country was in a depression. That was, of course, in the 1930s. Uh, two weeks uh, after I graduated from junior college, Dow Chemical Company in Midland, Michigan hired me. In Midland, which was about 25 miles away from where my folks lived, uh, I worked in order to gain money to continue my college education. While at Dow, I was fortunate since I was on a project to produce the purest butadiene that had ever been produced although I learned this much later, this butadiene played a key role relative to World War II. In the late 1930s, Japan was seizing control of the large natural gas, or natural, excuse me, natural rubber plantations in the Dutch East Indies. There was an urgent need to develop processes to produce synthetic rubber for both military and civilian use. The butadiene that was produced at Dow was employed in developing the needed processes. Of current interest, uh, most tires and most equipment requiring elastomers are, are currently produced using synthetic rubbers. By the fall of 1941, I had saved sufficient money to continue my chemical engineering education, which was at the University of Michigan. And that was uh, just before Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor and December 7th, 1941, sure brought on changes. What were those changes? Uh, well, I, um, first of all, um, we speeded up things very much at the, uh, as far as our schooling is concerned. Although I never served in the military, I received deferment since I would become a chemical engineer needed by numerous industries. When I graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1943, Dow Chemical offered me a job. However, I decided instead to get a master's degree. I then started, in addition, to work on a nitration project to develop improved techniques for producing high explosives. 
according to the letters from the uh, university, uh, it sounded as if the war effort would collapse if they uh, were to uh, take me and put me in the military. Our, as I said before, our studies at the university were speeded up. For example, I took a written examination on New Year's Day. It was probably 1943, in the middle of my, well, in the middle of my master's program, I was able to take a course in modern, told to take a course in modern physics. I said, I can think of some other courses. But the reply of my advisor was, you take that course. I, I, I said, I'll take that course. That was the feeling that we didn't question too much and did what we were told to to considerable extent. As this winter semester of 1944 progressed, I was advised that I would need to take a job in industry or be inducted into the military. I preferred going into industry. I thought I could perhaps do a more for my country. Uh, I had three job offers, which I think are interesting when I explain here. First, an oil company in California made me an offer even though I never visited them. Second, a company in New Jersey paid for me to come to New York City. Uh, yet their main headquarters was in New Jersey. Did they meet me in New Jersey? No, as I said, they met me in New York City for about two hours and offered me a job. It was unclear to me uh, what they really wanted me to do, so I said, I'll think about it. Then the third offer came. DuPont Chemical Company invited me to come to Cleveland. So I took the bus to get there. They offered me a job saying this was extremely important to the war effort and it sounded intriguing. My professors also recommended that I accept the DuPont offer. I did. When I reported to work for DuPont, and after I had signed the necessary secrecy papers, my supervisor picked up a slug of metal. He said, we call this tea metal, but it is really uranium. Thanks to the modern physics course, I had just completed, I instantly knew that the project involved atomic energy. I was not told more. Shortly thereafter, I learned that my supervisor was a Purdue graduate in chemical engineering. At a picnic that he held for our group at DuPont, I met his young son, who perhaps 13 years later would be a student in one of my Purdue classes. After about two months working in Cleveland, we were told that our group was to be divided. Part would go to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and the remainder to Hanford, Washington. We were told not even tell our family of our final location of where we would be located. By now, I realized that our work was highly secretive. I knew that the Secret Service had visited my little farm community to inquire about me. Shortly after this, I was on a train from Chicago to Pasco, Washington, a 50-hour trip. 
This trip was my first to the far west. As a little country boy, my horizons broadened greatly in 1944. In Washington, things were chaotic to say the least. The small village of Richland where we lived, uh, which was the headquarters for this, the, uh, the big headquarters, the uh, there of the atomic plant. Um, it was expanding, uh, Richland was expanding. The atomic units were built about by about, uh, as I learned later, 100,000 individuals living in trailer courts and semi-permanent quarters in Hanford, Washington, about 25 miles away. Hanford had itself been a small village perhaps two years ago. At work, it seemed to be a period of organization and waiting for the plant to be built. I learned initially little on the plant being built. Perhaps they were deciding who was trustworthy and capable. Eventually, however, I joined the health physics group, and that was in late 1944. Now, the health physics group was there to protect the plant workers from undesired levels of radiation. In the case of a severe accident, a member of our group acted like a captain of a, of a ship, taking over responsibility during an evacuation. The plant manager came to me shortly thereafter, and he let me know that he did not like this arrangement. As you can perhaps guess why, I was just a 23-year-old kid. He, at the time, uh, had had considerable experience and was at least in his 40s. He said to me, well, if we have a problem, come to me and I'll tell you what to do. In hindsight, I think I gave him a pretty good answer. I looked him square in the eye and I said, Carl, in the case of an accident, I will appreciate your advice before I make a decision. In any case, thank goodness we never had a serious accident. Once we did have a practice evacuation of the plant, just like a school fire drill. I was the last one on the bus and I told the driver, okay, now get going, or words to that effect. Health physics personnel were told in this period of time that our major objective was to produce atomic bombs. So I was in, that much on the end. I have rationalized and still do, although two bombs were dropped on Japan causing huge damage and casualties, we saved a large number of lives. In this time period, I knew, for example, that Japan was sending balloons filled with incendiary bombs over with the hopes that they would destroy the forest of Oregon and Washington. As far as we knew, they did had no idea that we were also in Washington trying to make atomic bombs. Some of the incendiary bombs did arrive, and there were a few casualties. These bombs were assembled by Japanese women and children as we were told. 
and has later been confirmed. We also heard that the Japanese were organizing civilians as well as the military when and if Japan was invaded. So I think I have a fairly strong case to indicate that maybe the, and I like to think this is true, that the atomic bombs did in the long run save lives. Re now let me change a little bit here okay, and show perhaps my present thinking. I knew that the Pisnel Papirius uh, and these bombs to be used were either plutonium or Hanford. Or, uh, plutonium, excuse me, produced at Hanford, or uranium separated from regular uranium at Oak Ridge. A bomb of very different design was needed in each for each metal. The two bombs that were needed for one for plutonium and one for uranium were to be developed at Los Alamos. This I knew. In 1945, July the year, the, the test bomb using plutonium was exploded. In early August of 45, the second bomb using uranium-235 was dropped at Hiroshima. It had never been tested till Hiroshima. Why? They had only enough uranium-235 for one bomb. Several weeks, or, or several days it was, um, but the plutonium bomb was exploded over Nagasaki. Japan surrendered about a week later. I did not know it at the time, but it would likely have been a month or more before we would have been able to drop a third bomb. But getting the plutonium was the bottleneck for the next bomb. It would have taken considerably longer to get uranium-235 for a second bomb. Now, as to the to the very recent past, several years ago, our government claimed Iraq was about to develop a plant for obtaining uranium-235, and then a an atomic bomb. Now claims are made that Iran will direct, develop atom bombs. Based on my experience, a country that does not have a good background in technical people cannot put a bomb together in a matter of several months. As a side note, I might say maybe they could buy a bomb by getting one of the Russian groups to sell them a bomb, but to develop a bomb is another matter. Well, thank goodness the war ended, and in September 1946, I was able to return to the University of Michigan to complete my Ph.D., at which I did by December 19. 49. Did you resign from DuPont to return to college? Yes, I did. I, um, uh, in um, General Electric was going to take over the plant. DuPont had completed their, their assignment and um, let me think, in the end of August of 1946, and uh, GE was to take over. 
So I came within one day. Maybe I overlapped one day, although I got no pay because we had a picnic the last day that I was there. Uh, it was Labor Day, and uh, then I took off to go back to the University of Michigan. Well, at the University of Michigan, I finished in 49, and I accepted a job with Colgate Palmolive. Uh, they were located in Jersey City, New Jersey. My job there was to help develop improved methods to produce soap and detergents. Quite a change from atomic bombs. Specifically, I was interested in the partial hydrogenation of triglyceride oils. That would be oils from uh, vegetable, uh, corn oil, soybean oil, cottonseed oil, that sort of thing. Um, although at, uh, at Colgate Palmolive they were perhaps more interested at the time in um, animal fats such as uh, beef tallow or uh, lard um, from um, pigs. One year after I was at uh, Colgate Palmolive, I received an offer to join the chemical engineering department at the University of Oklahoma. I accepted this offer. I lived in Oklahoma for four years. While there, I taught two or three courses per semester. Things were different in those days in teaching since there was more emphasis on teaching and, than is common today and somewhat less on uh, directing research. However, while at the Oklahoma, I directed research of nine graduate students, including one PhD. In early 1955, I interviewed for a position in Purdue's School of Chemical Engineering. I received and accepted their offer. Um, of course, I had by this time I had been married, uh, and I had married in March 1950 shortly after finishing my PhD. Now, let me talk a little bit about housing uh, and at the Purdue campus. When you came? Uh, a considerable number of the younger faculty member lived in temporary housing facilities. I forget what they were called. Uh, um, I recall there were maybe black or whites or something of that nature. Fortunately, however, my wife and I, and uh, we had two children by now, fortunately, uh, we, had, we got a house on State Street in Lafayette. That's where the elite lived, right across the street with some huge, huge houses. They were big. They were magnificent. And um, interestingly, uh, in those days, Purdue didn't offer me any funds for moving. Uh, we did have a mover move most of our things. I was very careful. I even weighed things to make sure that they didn't cheat me too much. But we also had a little trailer behind a car. I suspect we looked like Okies from Oki, uh, Oklahoma. What the neighbors in those houses uh, must have thought when they saw this uh, little trailer with a, a little top over it uh, come pulling up across the street from them. Uh, they really thought we were going downhill. 
We were very fortunate, however, and lived there for three years. But there were a few little bumps in the road. Uh, for example, which is interesting, in the winter time, um, the gas pressure dropped, uh, and we had a uh, an old furnace in the basement, but it had been converted to gas, and the gas pressure dropped. So uh, we didn't always get as much heat as we liked. In fact, I'm, as I recall, some industries actually shut down um, so that the pressures, uh, gas pressures in the homes didn't drop too much. Uh, most of my colleagues didn't have as nice a home as I did, and they wondered what kind of a pull I had. As far as I know, I was just lucky to get that house, and because they certainly didn't have a house nearly as nice as we did. That brings me up to uh, uh, um, some of my experiences at Purdue. Okay. Uh, when I interviewed at Purdue, the main emphasis was on teaching, and uh, my uh, teaching of interests and whatnot, uh, what, what courses I wanted. I got the impression that it was desired that I also do some research, but it was not emphasized. I could point out that in my four years at the University of Oklahoma that I had directed several graduate students, plus I had secured some government and industrial monies. They liked that. Anyway, the head seemed to like this, and I was offered a, a position as an associate professor. Hence, I obtained the same rank as I had at the University of Oklahoma, plus a slightly higher salary. At my Purdue, Purdue my colleagues in the 1950s did not make much effort, or certainly not as much as I did, to recruit new graduate students. Hence, in several years, I had directed uh, at, at one time, as much as, uh, or I had, or were, were directing at one time, eight to ten students. They probably had at most only two or three. These students helped me attract more students. I had a going program, and these students could essentially tell prospective students uh, that they had interesting projects, and as a result, I was able to be more selective on which new students I accepted. In the 50s and 60s, I taught two courses per semester. One course was for undergraduates, while the second was mainly for graduate students. In those days, we were never promised any support in the summer. Yet, my summers of 1956 to 1961, that's the first five years I was here in the summer, were hectic, but in hindsight, highly, highly instructive. For me. In 1956, Purdue offered me a summer teaching appointment for the first couple months. That, um, in the late summer, I worked for about a month with commercial solvents in Terre Haute. Uh, in early 56, they had learned of my nitration work with Lloyd Alexander while I was at the University of Oklahoma. Interestingly, Lloyd had obtained his PhD at Purdue and had developed a new process, uh, 
and developed a new process for nitrating propane. Commercial solvents had several years previously commercialized a nitration process using a Purdue technology. From 1957 through the summers from uh, uh, 57 to 60, I uh, worked in Terre Haute uh, at least part of the summer. In 57, I worked at Commercial Solvents for about one and a half months and the remainder of the summer was spent on a project for the National Science Foundation. I, well, on this project, I visited about 10 major universities located from Michigan westward to Washington State. The objective of these uh, visits was to evaluate the research capabilities of these universities. Um, other members of our group, uh, however, evaluated in the remainder of the country. I personally liked my choice, uh, and particularly to get back to Washington and Oregon, where I'd been uh, earlier. I took along my family, including two daughters, so they experienced a vacation while I visited universities. In 1958, part of my summer was in England and in Switzerland. I had papers accepted for international meetings in these two countries. In 1959 and 1960, I spent the entire summer at Commercial Solvent. They also supported part of my Purdue research. In 1961, I spent the entire summer at the Research Center of Standard Oil of Indiana in Whiting, Indiana. These experiences helped convince me that university professors would become more productive if they would get more contacts outside the university. Uh, now, uh, in choosing the research pro projects, uh, I prefer to seek areas that have already been commercialized. You can still get a heck of a lot of good fundamental knowledge and at the same time can test it out, uh, particularly if it's commercialized. Three companies have provided me such start in which I would, in hindsight, I'm very happy that I had it, that such experience were first commercial solvents and Standard Oil of Indiana. At this latter company, I developed an interest for better gasoline production. Alkylation was a way to produce the cleanest burning gasoline. That interest continues to the present. At uh, Coke at Palm Olive, I gained an interest in partial hydrogenation of vegetable oils to produce shortening and oil margarine. And we spent considerable time at Purdue uh, uh, developing even better techniques. Since being at Purdue, I have directed more graduate students than any past or present chemical engineering professor, about 110 students. I consider them my academic sons and daughters. It was not till the 70s that I first acquired an academic daughter. It was only then that a significant number of women became chemical engineers. These 
graduate students plus foreign scholars have been a rich and very real education to both me and my family. And for this, my, thanks to my wife, many have been guests for a meal in our home. Numerous students have been from foreign countries. A listing of countries with a number of students in decreasing order is approximately as follows. Taiwan, Europe, I'm thinking of some of the countries, France, England, Switzerland, Norway, and the Netherlands, and then India. Um, older or postdoc type of individuals have come from Hungary, three for, from there, China, four, Egypt, one. Uh, so we've gotten to know a little bit about the cultures of many foreign students. What a great education for the Albrights. And I hope that we've been able to teach them, and many of them have gone home, something about the United States. As far as my graduate students, I am extremely happy, and maybe I'm bragging a little bit, but doggone it, why shouldn't I? Uh, four of my graduate students have received Distinguished Engineering Awards from Purdue. Uh, first, James Hesselberth was a vice president of the DuPont Company. Second, Jaime Wisniak, originally from Chile, returned to Chile where he became head of the chemical engineering department at the Catholic University in Santiago. Later, he moved to Israel and became dean and then vice president of a major university there. Third, Che I. Kao became the chief scientist at Dow Chemical Company. Fourth, and just very recently, Mike Graff in February 2008 received the award. He is the in the recent past was president of the large subsidiary of Amico Oil and then of British Petroleum and he is now president of the North America subsidiary of Air Liquide of France. I've, as far as my colleagues are concerned None of them have re had more than one graduate student that has gotten a DEA. So uh, I am extremely pleased that my students have done as well. I might say three of my graduate students have also been honored by outstanding chemical engineering awards. Uh, I like to keep in track with my students. Do I do as good a job? Not always, but I try. Uh, let me mention, however, two former students who have interestingly have made quite a name for themselves. Uh, both of them got stopped their Purdue education at the bachelor's level. They were teammates on Purdue's basketball team. Terry Dishinger was first a member of the U.S. Olympic team, then an All-American star. 
after playing professional basketball and becoming a, uh, a uh, freshman or the rookie of the year, um, he became a dentist of all things. But his classmate and chemical engineer after graduating went to Harvard Business School. He returned to Lafayette to become vice president of National Homes. Several years later, he was received a DEA from Purdue. His name is Tim McGinley, and he is now head of Purdue's Board of Trustees. He's no longer a chemical engineer, but he uh, not a practicing chemical engineer. Uh, he is a businessman. Sometime back, Tim hired me to do a magic show for the kids at the Lafayette Country Club. Let me indicate a little bit about my magic, and it's been an interesting thing. I have a plaque in my office from Cary Dormitory for 25 years of service, 1958 to 1983. In that time period, the fall semester extended for two or three weeks to the next year. Cary Club and several other dormitories had holiday parties in December for underprivileged children. I was often invited to perform magic at these parties. I performed for 25 parties at Cary Hall. In my office, I have a picture in which I produce a live rabbit. I did produce rabbits in those days, but I don't do it anymore. Why? Well, times have changed. The children always want to hold a, or at least pet the rabbit. The rabbit might scratch them, or the children might get sick. Then I might be sued. This hobby incidentally helped me earn money while I was at the University of Michigan. I might say I add I like to, in many of my classes at some time, uh, at appropriate time, I would often do one trick. The class enjoyed that, or at least that is what I claim. Let me switch to uh, chemical engineering organizations and my activities. All right. I have been a member of both the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, which is the AICHE since the 1940s, um, and the American Chemical Society. In the 1970s, the AICHE elected me as a fellow and I have been active in that organization in at least three major ways. First, starting in the 1960s and lasting for about 20 years, I served on their education and accreditation committee and was also a member of about 12 accrediting committees that visited 12 different departments of chemical engineering. A school wishing accreditation must first, or at least in those days, uh, request the accreditation, the national accreditation organization and AICHE to be considered for accreditation in chemical engineering. 
the rules have changed somewhat, as I understand. But uh, in those days, the school would write a detailed report that should include key information on the, the curriculum, faculty, students, administrators, and as such. After a visiting committee was assembled, and in those days the AICAG uh, would select the member that, uh, uh, the chemical engineer that was to do it, and that um, visiting member was either from uh, another school or could be an industrial engineer. The committee then visited the school seeking accreditation for at least two days. Two full days, I might say. The objective of the committee was to confirm the information on the report and to learn what the faculty and administration was thinking. While there, I was always asked to visit at least several students. The chemical engineering visitor also met with the head of chemistry or his assistant to see what the chemistry department was doing. Other members of our visiting committee would visit the math department, the physics department, humanities, and social science, and etc. On the last day of the visit, the visiting committee met and discussed their thoughts and preliminary recommendations. Then, after leaving the school, each committee member prepared a written report indicating his finding and recommendations. And in the case of the chemical engineering visitor, the report was addressed to both the accrediting committee of AICHE and also the nationwide accreditation organization. The total time that I spent as a result of such a visit was at least five days. How long have I taken? It's a sixty. It's a sixty-minute tape. Okay. All right. How did uh, people that you interviewed during these visits respond? Well, I tried to uh, make it an interchange of information. My emphasis was to get to their thinking. I would frequently ask a member of the schools to which competing school or that he admired. One faculty member mentioned only the school from which he graduated. And that was not a school that had a, the best of reputations. That, in my opinion, was not the best reply. I hope to make these visits an experience for both broadening and enriching my career and also that where I could carry uh, on uh, or re report things. I might say that one of the schools that I really enjoyed visiting was the University of Puerto Rico in February. Since I lived in the Midwest, you can guess that I did not turn down this indication. Now, as far as my other activities with the AICHE, for 30 years I was a member of their speaking bureau. Based on my records, I was invited and then gave talks for 76 local sections of the AICH in 35, in 35 states plus one in Canada. I learned that 
uh, you did not give a highly technical report because most of the meetings were the evening after a nice dinner. Uh, my favorite topic was how to be ethical or how not to be unethical. In these talks, I always asked questions uh, and uh, the audience, and they provided answers. I frequently found that there was mixed answers. And it is of interest that we should get involved in this because, uh, as you know, some uh, big presidents of the companies have gotten into trouble with their ethics. I, in 1981, I was elected for a three-year term to the board of directors, uh, board of uh, directors of the AICAG, and that was a pleasure and a challenge. Now. They certainly helped me, and uh, I might say that uh, I have uh, uh, been most interested recently uh, of uh, trying to uh, get involved in several different areas. And along the way, I received teaching awards from Purdue uh, three times I received the Shreve Prize given to the chemical engineering professor voted by the seniors to be the best instructor. In 1980, I received the Potter Award for the best instructor in, in uh, the School of Engineering. Uh, a highlight for me was in... Uh, Year 2003, AICHE -E presented me with the Van Antwerpen Award. This award was to recognize my service in chemical engineering industries. Uh, an interesting thing about this was that uh, Dow Chemical Company sponsors this and provides a generous cash check. As I mentioned, I had worked for Dow from 1943 39 to 41. In 39, I received 64 cents an hour, or 25.60 a week. That was good money then. I did get some increases, partly due to the fact that John L. Lewis was holding some uh, strikes and whatnot. But in any case, the award I received in uh, 2003 uh, was a bigger award uh, than the total amount of money I had received from Dow from 1940-39 to 41. All I can say is thank you, Dow Chemical. I recently have been very involved in trying to finish a handbook and uh, uh, and plus do a couple of papers. The handbook will be, uh, and it's supposed to come out in um, September of 2008. Uh, it will be titled Albright's Chemical, Engin Chemical Engineering Handbook. It will complete, compete with uh, Perry's Chemical Engineering Handbook. I'd like to think that I have obtained a s excellent set of authors for the different chapters, and I do think that uh, it will have several advantages as compared to the chemical engineering handbook put out by Perry's. Uh, I have included, among other things, a couple of chapters on not all of the legal uh, or on the technical matters, but one on legal matters, including patents, one on ethics, which I am writing, 
and one on, uh, uh, on um, technical communication. Now, several of the chapters are written by Purdue professors or former students. The chapter on mathematics, the thermodynamics chapter, and the one on um, statistics. All are with people. I have professors from foreign countries, including Canada, India, and Singapore. It'll be a large book. Uh, but I do want to say one thing. I'm fortunate that my had two daughters, and uh, both of them have had some time, or spent time at Purdue. My older daughter um, spent a year here. She wanted to major in economics, but at the time they only offered it agricultural economics, so she transferred to the University of Michigan. She got her law degree there, and her father is bragging, but several years ago she gained recognition as one of the ten best lawyers in Illinois. In 2008, this year, she was recognized as one of the top lawyers in consumer law in Illinois. Uh, She's also been involved with a, as chairman of, or chairwoman of one of the major sections of the American Bar Association. My younger daughter started at school and then transferred to Purdue. She got her degree in entomology and is now in the St. Louis area. She testified last year and helped win a major award of money from a company for not following the law. Where my daughter have given my wife and me much pleasure. We have three grandchildren and six great grandchildren, and that keeps me busy. And particularly at Thanksgiving time, because then I have to do magic for the kids, and they can remember. <coughs> They can remember what I did three or four years ago, even though they're eight or nine years old at the time. The older folks can't remember that well. Now, I still come into Purdue. I try to swim every day at noontime. I like the new pool. I do wish that Purdue had two pools, however, because at Lambert time, uh, in August they shut down the the uh, the uh, intramural pool. But in any case, I do keep uh, active. We like to, my wife and I, used to go to. Camp Michigania. Unfortunately, she just passed away, and uh, but my daughter is planning to join me when we go to the uh, our family camp uh, in um, Upper Michigan. That's a nice thing. Your vacation. I think it is very nice, and I look forward to it. My wife would have really liked to have gone. Things have sure changed here. Uh, I do not, or have not been in all of the new buildings around here, and uh, uh, I must say an interesting story that uh, I have a Chinese scholar working with me now uh, for a year, and I showed him around and showed him where the Neil Armstrong building was, which is right essentially next door to us, 
And uh, uh, I, when I went over there and showed him that, and I said, this is the Armstrong building, he immediately replied, oh, you mean the man that walked on the moon? So the Armstrong legacy at least arrived in China. So I don't keep up to date with all of the things, but it's been a wonderful life at Purdue. Good. Thank you very much, Professor Albright. This concludes the interview. Thank you.